Well, Shabbat Shalom and welcome. This is VBS Torah study for Shabbos. This is Shabbos Hagadol, the Sabbath directly. Matzah, matzah, matzah. Matzah, matzah. And I'm Ed Feinstein, Rabbi at Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, joined by my matzah crazed friend. Oh, am I crazed for matzah? Rabbi Mark Gelman of South Florida. Mark, Shabbat Shalom. Happy Shabbat Pesach. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Kashem Sameach and uh, a happy and kosher Passover. So you. every Passover, you know, begins with a question. Yep. Why is tonight different from all other nights? That's the way the Seder is constructed. But this year, I think the entire Jewish community is asking that question in a different note. Why is this Pesach different from all other Pesachs? Because of the catastrophe of October 7th, the continuing crisis with the hostages who were held in Gaza, this now current back and forth between Israel and Iran, I think all of us are looking at the Seder with different eyes. And the question that everyone I know is asking me is the Seder is supposed to be about hope. How do we find hope? How do we find hope in the Seder? What does the Seder teach us about finding hope? How are we going to say the words of the Seder, knowing that there are people um, held as hostages in Gaza and as well as this conflict keeps going on and on, knowing that all of the all of the catastrophe of the Gaza right now, Mark, how do we find hope this year? Okay, uh, I was looking for an answer to that question, and I couldn't get beyond the beginning of the seder, which is the beginning of the Magid, After we break the Maza and do the Karpas, and we start into the telling which is really what the Haggadah means. Haggadah means a telling. So in the beginning of the Magid, in the Halach Ma'anya, the first real prayer of the Magid, it says, Behold the matzah, of the bread of poverty, which our ancestors ate in the land of Eden. It's also interesting that it's in Aramaic. It's not in Hebrew. So it's taking a, there's an there's a edge to it, which is intended by the uh, rabbis. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are needy come and celebrate the Passover with us. So in the Magid, in the beginning of the story, we have everything that's important in the story. And everything that's important in the story is everything that's important in Passover. Okay? First is the matzah. You can't have Passover without matzah, which means there has to be some ritual identity to what we're doing here. And it really does come down to eating matzah. And when you look at people who aren't really keeping Passover and eat chumitz during Passover, a lot of them won't eat hummets. They'll they'll try not to, and they'll eat matzah. So the first thing is eat matzah. Something so simple, bread, and it's not simple at all because Gandhi once wrote, to a hungry man, God is bread. So let's start with the most basic thing, bread. The bread of affliction, okay? And then let all who are hungry come and eat, called dirchvin. That means don't think this Passover is just about you and your needs and your family and you what you want and what you have. This is about opening your eyes to the world and letting people who are hungry into your world. I've been telling all my students who call me and wish me happy Passover, go work in a soup kitchen during Pesach mm. and bring everyone you know to a soup kitchen. Don't tell them anything. Don't give them a whole drasha about you. You should be grateful because look at these people. They'll pick it all up on their own. All they need to do is to see somebody who's living in a car coming for their only meal of the day because you gave it to them. Mm. That's what you need. That's what the Buddha said once to a friend. Do you need a, be a beggar today? I'm a beggar. So do you need a beggar? And yes, we need beggars. Okay. Now we're here next year. We observe Passover in the land of Egypt. 
I mean, in the land of Israel, Passover in the land of Israel. So the the next part of Passover is we are not Luft mentioned, we're not air people. We're rooted in a land. Mm. And it's time for us to distinguish between Zion and the state of Israel. We are attached to Zion, to the spiritual name for the homeland of the Jewish people. Now, the Jewish state we're also connected to, but that's different than Zion. And so what we want is to return to the land of Israel the way that pilgrims return to their home. And this is the final one, and this is the main one this year for me. Okay, so that means now we're enslaved. Next year, maybe we all be free. All right. This year in your seders, in my seder, the and in everyone, Seder, I hope, there will be a moment when we pray for the hostages release. But what Hashtafa means is not just that the, the hostages are, are enslaved, are, are lacking their freedom, but we are as well. So the last part of it is, what does it mean to be free? And of course, the first thing it means is get the hostages out. But there's something else that we can do before the hostages get out, which is, of course, beyond all of our control. And that is to not be so grim. I'm hearing from rabbis particularly, just cries of gewalt that Israel is going to die. This is the end of Israel. It's going to die. Uh, there's too much dissent. There's too much this, that, this. Too many enemies. The, we're losing the PR war. There's a million things people are saying. Stop. Stop. When you have a kid who's scared that there's something under the bed and that if he gets out of bed, the thing under the bed's going to get him, which, by the way, is true. Okay. But you can't tell, you can't scare the crap out of your kid. Mm. You just can't do it. You have a responsibility as a parent to sing a lullaby. What's a lullaby? A lullaby is a song that all, that's different verses, different lullabies, but they all have the same meaning. And the meaning of a lullaby is it's going to be okay. So let's just try and focus this Pesach on that's wonderful and it's especially interesting your your message to colleagues to to rabbis yeah about the message that they bring to their communities do you feel that are you here are the you sense here? of crisis yeah the it's, sense of it's, over gewaltig <laughs> well i don't know if it's over but because i think it's realistic look I, I taught a class for the high school um, here uh, uh, this last week. And yeah. I, what I did, I, I, I took the kids. I said, let's go back to 1890. And I want to introduce you to three Jewish families, a family in Iraq, in Baghdad, a family in, um, in, in Europe, in, in Eastern Europe, let's say in, uh, in Minsk, and a family in Western Europe, let's say in Vienna. And we looked at texts that reflected their experience, right? And then I said, each of these families is feeling that the world is changing and not for the better. The family in Baghdad is dealing with the rise of more radical forms of Islam that are making it harder and harder for Jews to live. The family in Minsk is facing the May laws passed after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II and the discrimination and the pogroms that are 1200 pogroms in eastern europe during the end of the 19th century and the family in western europe although they're living a very materially comfortable life is feeling that anti-semitism will always be part of its culture and never allow them to be fully members of the larger society all three families and i said to these kids they're wonderful kids i said all right here's the question i want you to ask what do we do do we stay 
Do we stay? And if we stay, what are we? What's going to get us through? Do we go to America? And I looked at some texts about the promise of America, or do we go to Israel, and the promise of Zionism? And I, you know, we looked at each one of these, and the kids had wonderful conversations about. Well, going to America would be the right thing to do, but it's hard to get there. It's hard to get out. It's hard to go. We have family here. What do you do about an old grandparent who's still here who can't travel? The kids came up with this. It was a brilliant conversation. And I said to them, you know, your families made this decision. And they were facing these three things. There's the promise of messianism, the Jewish idea that someday God will redeem us, the promise of American liberalism, and the promise of Israeli sovereignty, of Zionism, which was sovereignty will save us. And then I pointed out at the end of the lecture, the end of the talk, that the reason why so many of us are feeling so difficult right now is that all three of these promises seem to have sort of, they've been shaken. I wouldn't say they're gone. God forbid that they're gone, but they're shaken. We're still waiting for the Messiah. That's not any imminent, right? And most of us have given up on, a, on, on that kind of belief, except, you know, my friends in Chabad are so still into Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. But most of us recognize that we are agents of our own redemption. And that leaves us these two choices the American promise and the Israel promise. And both of them have been shaken this year, right? France, Franklin Foer, a journalist, wrote this, hmm. I thought it was brilliant, but brutal in article in The Atlantic, which has now become a Jewish magazine, of course, um, where, where he basically said this is the end of the golden age of American Jewry, that we are now going to fight anti-Semitism all the time. And it's now become a factor in our existence. And of course, in Israel, you know, you have the you have Hamas on one border, Hezbollah on another border, and Iran just across the way. And and it's so difficult to imagine what's gonna happen next. There's no strategic vision that can show us a way out of this problem, of this dilemma right now. And so all of us are feeling this tentativeness. And and that's where we are. So I, I you know, I, I agree with you that the the dire dark you know, prophecies yeah. of destruction are not going to help us because a community that makes decisions in an atmosphere of crisis never makes good decisions. Never. But and I and I would say I want to add one thing. Think back to nine eleven, and think back to what you did. I know I did it, and I was in the belly of the beast. Right. I spoke at the the memorial service at Yankee Stadium as president of the New York Board of Rabbis. I was shaking, I was vomiting, I was gone. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, I finally decided I'm not watching TV anymore. I'm not, I, there's a limit to how many times I can see the planes hit the towers. Yeah. And so part of the reason that we, we were feeling so down is that we are obsessed with what the news brings us. And the news is built on its own principle, which I was told by the people at Good Morning America directly, which is if it bleeds, it leads. Right. That's the concept of the news. So they're only going to broadcast the bad news and they're going to get us crazed. And I think it's time for Jewish leaders to become Jewish parents of the American Jewish community and do what parents do, who are good parents, who say, look, Wojciech, it's going to be okay. Yeah, Everything will be okay. It's going to be all right. And if you want to add in, God will protect us. If you want to add, however your spiritual life is organized, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you, an authority figure whom they love, and who is their teacher in the most important ways, is saying to you, everything is going to be all right. Right. See, I, I, I'm not sure I would say in that terms. I, I would, I would phrase it differently. First okay. of all, I think we have to accept small victories, right? It's true that the other night, the angel of death came back to take us. Three hundred and fifty Iranian missiles were fired at Israel. Yeah. But the amazing story was not only that they were all knocked out of the sky, except for two or three of them but that it was a cooperative effort between Israel, France, Britain, 
Saudi Arabia and Jordan. For the first time, the Jordanians, who have been our allies for so long, have fought on our side against an attack, and the Saudis are on our side. And, and that there's a world sense of this, this was a catastrophe. So that's number one. Number two, um, you know, you'd much rather be Benjamin Netanyahu today than, than Sinwar, who's in a tunnel in the bottom of Rafa, rotting like a rat where he belongs. You know, we want to get our hostages out, but Israel has done a remarkable job. And yes, there have been casualties, but the casualties are, are so much fewer. And I know that each one is precious. I get that. But the casualties are so much fewer than what we expected them to be to accomplish what they've accomplished so far. Right. And and the the real the real the bigger issue, the bigger picture is not the small things, but the big things. Look at where we were in 1890. In 1890, we, we didn't have a country. I mean, so this is the, the problems we face at the moment are the problems of a country that has power. And the, and the question of American Jewry is the same question. What, what makes the current anti-Semitism so radical is that for the last 50 years, we haven't seen anything. I mean, I've lived in a bubble. My kids are raised in a bubble where there's no anti-Semitism. And we are so prominent in this society that it's hard for us to imagine that there are people who actually hate us. After all, Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld are on television, right? That the second, the first, the second gentleman of the United States is a, is a, is a, is a member of our community. Uh, you know, I mean, so the, it, we're in a much better position than we've ever been in. Yeah, there's challenges. Congratulations. That's the Jewish condition. Hashta avde l'shana habab b'nei chorin. Yeah, we're not finished. The world's not finished. And yet, hope. this hope. Yeah, so, I love that. That's exactly right and perfect. And I, I would add some other small victories that we should not overlook. And one of them also happened this week aside from the knocking down the missiles. And that is, I think finally, the evil doers in America, the anti-Semites, the ones who are marching and screaming death to America, closing down bridges and demonstrating at Columbia, they were arrested last night. They were arrested by the New York Police Department that was called to arrest them by the administrators of Columbia University. An Egyptian-born um, economist who is now the president of Columbia University. Called the police. Right. So that's, a very, that, that's not a small thing. And I'll add to some more victories since... You can't be positive with your children and your colleagues unless you actually have some reasons here. And here's another one. The Google people who occupied their boss's office saying, we support Hamas. Not one of them, by the way. Forget the free speech thing for people who are into that. Okay, if you have free speech, how about one sentence of, and of course we want the hostages released. No, no, it's we want Israel destroyed. So these people who occupied their boss's office are no longer working for Google. Hmm. And we know, of course, that the people who signed the petition blaming Israel immediately before they even invaded Gaza for everything under the sun at Harvard, they're not getting jobs because their names have been posted around the from the elite colleges and they're not getting jobs. So, which is exactly right. That's the consequence they should have to deal with for just like if they were in the Ku Klux Klan. You don't want people who peddle in hate to be rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. So they were they were fired from Google. So what I, and and I guarantee you, and Victor Davis Hansen just did a nice piece on this. Um, that the people who are trapped on a bridge that's been blocked by these people for hours while they scream death to America, I, I guarantee you 
they are not being converted to the cause of Hamas because of that. Yeah. The opposite is going to happen. People are going to say, okay, time out. Time out. Just like they did after the burning of stores and the looting of stores in 2020, the summer. People said, okay, this is just, this is too much. This is too much. We need some law and order going on around here. And whether it affects the political future of America, who knows, that's not our job to talk about. But the basic thing is, there are more than one or two little victories. Yeah. And I believe that we are, I truly believe that we are at a point now where Israel and Jews who have been losing the PR war are slowly, slowly, slowly regaining the moral high ground. And I think Israel is to be vastly praised for basically not responding to the Iranian attack. They bombed in Isfahan something out in the middle of nowhere that killed nobody and did nothing probably. And uh, so, but they did it to say, okay, you know we could do something worse, but we didn't. And and so I, Israel has shown remarkable restraint is what I'm trying to right. say. Right. So my friend Noam Tzion, who's a wonderful teacher of Judaism in Jerusalem, and his son, Rabbi Mishael Tzion, who's a wonderful young teacher of his, they came up with a, a new Haggadah, or rather a new, uh, they, they wrote a Haggadah for Israel. They, they wrote a beautiful new Haggadah for Israel with beautiful illustrations and poetry reflecting on this question. And they, we collected some money and they've printed it now and distributed it all over Israel, particularly to the families of those who were displaced from their homes and families from the kibbutzim. And there's an English version out there that's available. That's quite wonderful. And he makes a very... That on your, uh, I will. Yeah. He makes a very interesting point. He says, uh, he, says, he says, in the Haggadah, you have two statements. The one statement that we all know by heart, the whole door of Hador, in every generation, each one of us sees himself, herself, as if we personally came out of Egypt. That image of history is that history is, is, it leads up to a moment of apocalyptic redemption. We cross the sea and all is well, and the credits roll and everything is fine. And that's what we're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate crossing the sea. But there's another statement. A little bit later in the Haggadah. And it says, In every generation, same language, they rise up against us to destroy us, and God rescues us. And that's a different attitude. That says history is not one apocalyptic moment of redemption. Don't wait for that apocalyptic moment of redemption. That's not how history works. History is a cycle. History is a cycle of goods and bads. History is a cycle of moments of prosperity, freedom, and security, and moments of insecurity and challenge and difficulty. And God, in that theology, God rescues us when it gets too dire. In that theology, we have the, in a different theology, God has given us the tools to protect ourselves and to sustain ourselves through those difficult times. And what Noam suggests is that, you know, it, the reason why we find the Haggadah difficult or the Seder difficult this year is because we're looking for the Red Sea, for the, for the big moment of redemption, when we shouldn't be. It's the other one. It's these moments of catastrophe that come upon us and have been coming upon us for generations and generations and generations. And the, the capacity of this people to sustain itself, to protect its spirit, its cultural and spiritual resilience, to get through these moments without losing hope, without losing a vision. And he says, if you put the two together, you add them up together, yeah, maybe we have a hope for a, for a moment, apocalyptic moment of redemption. But in the world we live in, we're going to have to deal with these difficulties and find the resilience to make our way through. And I think that's a very interesting apposition, a very interesting sort of dialogue between those particular texts. I like that. 
there's uh, Hegel talked about moments when the Weltgeist, the world spirit, came and changed things. And uh, they were, and, and, and Hegel said it happens not through great storms and upheavals, but it happens because of what he called in German Weltgeschichte individual, world historical individuals. You know, people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Mother Mother Teresa, you know, people who in their own way change the world. In their own way, they just they they just change the world. And I know that Tom Hartman and I didn't change the world, but what I do know is that for 25 years, people watching Good Morning America or Imus or anywhere saw a priest and a rabbi who were best friends. That never happened before, Eddie. And it hasn't happened since. And a priest so, and a well, rabbi who could who who talked a very deeply moral language about the world we're living in. Um and listen to each other, which is even yeah, more. That important. was the thing. And yeah. so that was the thing. The final, the final message, and you know, you and I have had this. Can I I want to interrupt you one more point? Oh. I, I think this idea of world, what was it? World world historical individuals. World historical individuals. I, I want to make a, a nomination. Yeah. And the nomination is going to be we know that on October 7th, the Israeli government, even the Israeli army, as great as it is, failed terribly yeah. and yeah. all of those people including so many young people were murdered br brutally and those taken hostage but what happened next was remarkable and if you've been listening to the podcasts and reading the reports of israel everyone in israel was worried about this next generation they were the tiktok generation kids who were glued to their phones kids who seemed to be very self-indulgent and yet in israel that generation showed up. I mean, that generation showed up. First of all, the government completely failed. And so it was the same people that were out in the street the week before demonstrating against the government that turned those networks of communications and cooperation into networks of social welfare to protect the folks who survived in the South and give shelter to those who had to leave the North. And then all of these young guys, these men and women who, who, who were, who were in, his, in, his, in uniform and in, in the Miluim show up. You know, they, it, you, typically when Israelis go to war uh, or have a, have a conflagration of some sort and they have a call up, they expect to get 80 to 90 percent. 80 percent is the number of those who will come and fight. And this time they got 130 yeah. percent. That is got to something like 160,000 Israelis who live outside of Israel, got on flights, flew back to Israel, and showed up at their mustering stations ready to, to take up arms to protect the country. I mean, the stories were amazing. So world historical individuals, this year I think it's the collective. For us, it's the collective. It's this generation of young Israelis who said, I'm here to fight for my country. I'm here to fight for my people. I'm here to fight for the dream of Zion. And, and I think you have to hold that. It gives you tears in your eyes when you hear these stories about how wonderful these kids are and how brave they are and how incredibly giving they are. And then the whole world Jewish community showing up. The American Jewish community raised three quarters of a billion dollars in a course of weeks in order to send relief and help. You know, and I know I get political, but I think you got to give a little bit of credit to the president of the United States who himself has been a sort of hero in this. And I know this criticism and I know people don't like certain things, but still I got to give it to him too. I'm going to mention him at my Seder too. Your turn. Good luck. Um, the, what I'm going to mention is finally, you know, I've shared with you in the past, my drusha that I'm actually enamored with a lot of my midrashim are like my children i they're good they're okay they're better than others one i this one i really liked it, and it was because it's the last one that i thought up 
uh, the most recent, and that's the reversal of the four sons. You know that how it it isn't a descending order from the wise son at the top to the one who doesn't know how to ask at the bottom. It's the reverse. That the wise son is at the lowest spiritual level and the one who doesn't know how to ask is at the highest spiritual level. And I'm not going to go into the whole drasha here, but it's basically my view that this was the secret story put into the Haggadah by the rabbis for those who really wanted to know what the meaning was. And some who had also had influence from Buddhism. This is my theory. Because they lived after the Buddha's teachings that already penetrated through the spice route and, and through Asia Minor. And that is the, the, the son, She'eno Yodea Lisho, the one who doesn't know how to ask. And their response, he says, doesn't know how to ask. You say, but he got it to the being called Yomahu. It's Exodus 13, 8, which doesn't have Ke'ilu in it, which says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what God did for me when I left Egypt. For me. Which, right. of course, is not true. And I, we've talked last week about the effort to try to make meaning out of an uh, impossible verse. Um, but I'm thinking of the child who doesn't know how to ask, I'm thinking about two people, Plato and the Buddha. Plato said he was a philosopher only because he knew he knew nothing. And he would he could refute everyone else, but he didn't know anything and didn't propose that he knew anything. And Buddha had the same basic attitude for his followers, that, that there is no truth at all is uh, sati parkhana is a dependent co-origination it's a complex buddhist idea but basically it's that nobody knows anything and i i i'm going to close my seder with this idea for my people stop with the idea let's just stop with this idea that we can figure this up Oh, the war, the war in the Middle East. Yeah, we can figure that out, right? Oh, people. Why do people hate Jews? Yeah, we can figure that out. Yeah, why are people still hungry in America, which has more food that's making people sick from overeating? Well, we there are things we don't know, things we can't know, and there are people who are working away. On, you know, Elon Musk and these people putting chips in your head and AI. And there's things that we just don't know. And it's and it sort of meshes with your point about from the Haggadah in Israel, that there's little victories along the way, not massive upheavals. I'm I'm just telling people, be patient with what you don't know. Because no one knows anything. And because if you think that you can work stuff out at your Seder table and figure out the answer, or if you think that some politician that you know on either side has the great answers of the future of the world, it's ridiculous. Nobody knows. Mm. And so the important things are the things that nobody knows. And let's embrace them. Part of the Passover Seder is embracing the things that nobody knows. And as we spoke of last week, I don't know what it means that I left Egypt. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm an old man now, and I still haven't figured it out. But I'm patient with it. And maybe on the last day, after I say vidui and, I, and God kisses me on the lips and takes my breath away, Maybe on that day, I'll know what it means to leave Egypt. I, I don't know. Mm. But for now, on this Passover Seder, I'm prepared to live with what I don't know. I'm prepared to live with the child who doesn't know how to ask as my hero. That's a beautiful drusha. I love that. And I'll answer. Here's mine. Here's mine. 
So, yeah. and I've said this in other venues, so people have heard this before. My brothers and I, because we all have, we're very rowdy and have wicked sense of humor, would go looking for the weird things and statements in all of the liturgy and other places too. And we, we, were, we would read Dayenu. And, and the Dayenu prayer is a beautiful prayer because it identifies each of the miracles of our redemption and says, you know, God, that had been enough. And the first thing is like, no, it wouldn't have been. You know, if you brought us into the desert and didn't give us anything to eat, it would have been enough. No, it wouldn't have been. But the one that we used to joke about that was the funniest one was Ilu Hevianu Lahar Sinai Velona Tanlanu at the Torah. If you had brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah, like that would have been great, right? We show up and say, like, we're here. Like, what's supposed to happen? Like, do you put a quarter in a machine? Like, Where's You're the impossible. show? You're no, impossible. No, no. And we would joke about this. And then, you know, no, here's the good story. Here's the punchline. I, 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 I've studied these things, you know, because I'm interested in what to do at each, at each Seder. And I found a Hasidic commentary on the Haggadah. And the guy, the Hasidic teacher that wrote this commentary, wrote on that line. And he said something which just completely changed my mind and blew my mind. He said, he said, what's a miracle? He said, a miracle is two things. Yeah, a miracle is an event that makes us stop and go, wow. But the other piece of a miracle is that you have to be open to it. You have to be ready for it. Yeah. You have to be sensitive. You have to be mm -hmm. listening. You have to be watching. You have to be mindful, paying attention. And what he said is, if you'd brought us to Mount Sinai, if you'd made us ready for the miracle, that itself was a miracle. You, we were slaves. We were so in, we were so inured. We we're so closed. Our eyes are closed. Our ears are closed. Our souls were shriveled. But what happened is at, Har si at Mount Sinai, you opened us up so we could see the miracles that were in front of us. And you know, God, you didn't even need to do the miracles. Just opening us up was a big enough miracle because life is full of miracles all the time. And just opening yourself up to them changes the way that you look at you, you walk the world and you look at the life. And I would say today, you know, we're all broken. We're all sad. We're all depressed. We're all worried as hell. Open us up to the miracles that are there in front of us. Right. Open us up to the miracles that are ours. And Mark, one of those miracles is this. Thank you for all your teaching. Thank you for your love and your care. Thank you for sharing us. Uh, I know Betty's coming home, so I hope she's traveling safely and have a wonderful reunion. And I want to wish everyone who's watching a happy, healthy Zizen Pesach, a sweet and wonderful Pesach. Mark, hug some. A Zizen Pesach to you, my dear friend. Amen.